I am a pediatrician, a researcher, and a parent, and I became those things in that order. And the reason the sequencing is important is because even though I was a doctor who took care of children for a while, and I was a researcher who studied ways to keep them healthy, it wasn't until I became a parent that I got interested in, some might even say obsessed with,、uh, early learning. It was 14 years ago when my son was born, and I took a month paternity leave to be with him in his third month of life. And now, in retrospect, as a pediatrician, I should have known better because I opted for the time when colic crescendos. And <laughs> I spent that month、uh, with him in a snuggly, bouncing on a big blue ball, and watching more daytime television than I have in my life. And noticed that he was actually interested in, and as much as I like to believe that my two-month-old was following CNN as closely as I was, it was obvious to me that he wasn't. And yet, something about that experience was important to him. Now, why do these early experiences matter? The typical newborn brain is 333 grams, and in the first two years of life, it actually triples in size. It's an extraordinary period of brain growth. Uh, unparalleled over the life course, and you can see that here. Here is both brain growth over the lifespan, and you can see、uh, how steep the rise is early on, and it continues to to grow until about age 20. And I'll let you guys in the audience find yourselves over on the right there, <laughs> and see why you had such a hard time finding your car keys this morning. Now we're actually born with a lifetime supply of brain cells or neurons. That's not what actually grows. It's the connections between those brain cells, what we call synapses, that account for that brain growth. And those synapses form based on early experiences. If you will, the mind is fine-tuned to the world that babies inhabit. And to give you an example of that that you can all relate to, any child born anywhere in the world can learn to speak any language fluently. But if she isn't exposed to certain sounds early in the first few years of her life, she can learn to speak another language later. But she'll never sound like a native speaker. So a baby born today in mainland China, as amazing as it is, can learn to speak fluent Mandarin. But if she doesn't hear English sounds early in her life, she can learn to speak English later. But as we all know, we know such people. She'll struggle making certain sounds. It wasn't because she wasn't born with that capacity. It was because her early experience didn't condition her mind to learn them. Now, this graphic actually shows just that. What you see is the brain, and you see the neurons and the synapses connecting them. We're born with about 2,500 synapses. By age three, we have 15,000. And then over time, those connections are actually pruned in response to、uh, the external stimulation, the external world that we live in. Now, to give you another example of that, this is the breathing pattern of a one-day-old infant listening to music, and you can see here that he's listening to Mozart, and then Stravinsky is put on, and then Mozart again. Now, I show you this not to present some kind of an infantile critique of classical music, but. <laughs> And those of you in the audience who are、uh, classic music aficionados might have a hypothesis about why Stravinsky did this to his breathing pattern. But the point is, the point is that even at one day of life, there is a discernible physiological reaction to what babies are actually hearing. Now we know from decades of research that too little stimulation early on is bad for brain development. I show you here two PET scans. Now, PET scans are measures of brain function. The brighter colors show more brain activity. And on the left is a PET scan of a normal kindergartner, and on the right is a PET scan of a child who was raised in a horribly、uh, neglected environment. This is actually a PET scan from a child who was raised in a Romanian orphanage and was profoundly neglected early in life. And you'll notice that there are areas of his brain that show no activity at all. It didn't develop as a result of too little stimulation. Now, this is a horrific example of too little stimulation, and the untoward consequences of it. But the question we've had in our lab for some time is, what about too much? Is it actually possible to overstimulate the developing brain, or more、uh, appropriately, to inappropriately stimulate the developing brain in ways that are actually not beneficial but harmful? And this is important because we're technologizing childhood today in a way that's unprecedented. In 1970, the average age at which children began to watch television regularly was four years. 
like this cute little girl here. And today, based on research that we've done, it's four months. It's not just how orally they watch, but how much they watch. The typical child before the age of five is watching about four and a half hours of TV a day. That represents as much as 40% of their waking hours. Which brings us to Baby Einstein. Now, many of you probably have not seen Baby Einstein, but I will show you a random 20-second clip from Baby Einstein Day on the Farm, and, and here it is. Uh, in that 20-second clip, there were seven scene changes, about one every three seconds. It's about the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> and of course, it's nothing like being on a real farm, right? Adults watching this find it discombobulating because your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of this, and there is no coherent narrative. It jumps all over the place. But babies aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not capable of doing that. It's all of that screen change, all of that stimulation that's keeping them actually engaged in the screen. So we've had for a while what we call the overstimulation hypothesis, which is that prolonged exposure to this rapid image change during this critical window of brain development would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input, and that would lead to inattention in later life. So you watch enough Baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and when you go to a farm as a school-aged child, it's boring. It's too slow. How come there's no sheep suddenly popping into my face? How come there's no marionette going back and forth? Why do I have to walk from here to there? That's the general idea, that you're conditioning the mind to that reality, which doesn't actually exist. And we, we tested this uh, some years ago, and what we found was that the more television children watched before age three, the more likely they were to actually have attentional problems at school age. Specifically, for each hour that they watched before the age of three, their chances of having attentional problems was increased by about 10 percent. So a child who watched two hours of TV a day before the age of three would be 20 percent more likely to have attention problems compared to a child who watched none. Now, what else did we find? We found that the more cognitive stimulation children uh, received, and we measured cognitive stimulation in terms of how often parents read to their child, how often they took them to the museum, how often they sang to them, we found that cognitive stimulation reduced the chances of attentional problems later in life. In fact, each hour of cognitive stimulation reduced them by about 30 percent. So if you will, these are two sides of the same coin. There are certain things that we can do early on in our children's lives that enhance their ability to pay attention, and certain things that we can do early on that actually impede them. Now, if our hypothesis was right, that it's based on the, the pacing of the programs, and you might imagine that what children watch actually is important. And so content would be key. And I'll give you two examples of content to illustrate that point. The first is the Powerpuff Girls movie the right mix of sugar and spice for a satisfying rush. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but here's a scene from that. Okay, so that was, again, you can see a lot of rapid sequencing. In fact, this was the first movie that was ever rated PG for non-stop frenetic animated action. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making it up, that's the back of the box there. Now, I want to contrast that with something that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, it really needs no introduction, but this is a clip from Mr. Rogers for you to watch. Hi. I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. I brought my television neighbor to see what a restaurant was like. Oh, I'm so glad. Can I show you a table? Certainly. I'm awfully busy today. One of the waitresses is ill. I see. So I'm sort of doing double duty. How about this? This is fine. Thank Grand. you very much. Sit down and I'll be right back. All right. When 
when you come to a restaurant, usually somebody shows you what table you're supposed to sit at. And uh, one of the first things you do is to put your napkin either on your lap or up here. And then, well, this is the way a table is set. So. Fred, Fred Rogers invented reality TV. He's, <laughs> he's not credited with it. Actually, it's, it's not reality, right? It's even slower paced than reality. Uh, the, the, the waitress says, I'm awfully busy, but she doesn't seem the least bit hurried. <laughs> so you can see that there are very, very real differences in pacing. And when we followed up our study with a subsequent experiment to look at what children actually watch, what you see is that educational programs like Mr. Rogers pose no increased risk of attentional problems. Entertainment programs like the Powerpuff Girls movie increase the chances by about 60%. And violent programming, which I didn't show you, increases it even by more than 100%. And violent programs are typically even more rapidly sequenced. Now, in the last year, we've been building actually a mouse model of television viewing in my lab. And you are now watching Mouse TV here. Uh, the sounds are from the Cartoon Network, and the lights are uh, basically photorhythmically generated by those sounds. This is what it looks like. There's, these are the TV lounges here that the mice live in. Uh, and they have speakers above and lights around them. And what we do is we start about 10 days of life, and these mice watch TV six hours a day for 42 days. It's basically their entire childhood spent in front of a television, which is not uncommon these days for some children even. And then 10 days later, we actually assess their behavior in a few ways I want to show with you. The first test we do measures their activity and risk taking. Now, we do what's called the open field test. Now, mice have two kind of competing instincts. You'll see them here. One is to avoid being in the middle of anything, because of course, mice have very few friends. And being in the middle of this open field is risky. But of course, they have a competing interest uh, instinct to forage for food. So at some point, they do need to go into the middle and explore their environment. Now, we put these mice in here and test them, and we exploit the fact that it's a white mouse on a black background. And with a computer above, we can actually track their movement. And you can see on the left is sort of a normal mouse spending most of its time around the perimeter. But look at the one on the right. Notice how much time it spends in the middle, but also notice just how much general activity this mouse is actually exhibiting. So this is both a hyperactive and a risk-taking mouse. And when we look at our, our overstimulated compared to our control mice, we find that the overstimulated mice spend more time in the center, and they enter the center more than the regular mice do. The next test we do is what's called the novel object recognition, and this tests short-term memory and learning. We put a mouse in a, in a box with two objects, and the mouse will explore both of them, get to know them, if you will. And then we take the mouse out, and an hour later, we replace one object with a novel object. And we see how much time the mouse spends on each object. Now, the mouse that is learning, that has good short-term memory, will spend more time on the novel object. And you can see that here, as opposed to the one on the right, which is spending the same amount of time with both objects. And what did we find? Well, we found that our control mice, our normal mice, spent 75% of their time with a novel object. But look at what our TV viewing, our overstimulated mice, did. They spent the exact same amount of time. It was as if they couldn't distinguish the two objects or they didn't care. But one way or another, they were not learning. They were not acting like normal mice. Now, I want to st talk a little bit about a study we did with, with children. It's a building block study. It was a randomized trial here in a low-income clinic in Seattle. We took 200 children who were 18 to 24 months of age. And we gave half of them blocks at the beginning of the study and half of them blocks at the end. And their parents got what we call blocktivities monthly. These were ways to play with your children with blocks. Sort the blocks, stack the blocks, count the blocks. Really simple things that come naturally to a lot of parents, but what a lot of low-income parents don't do with their children regularly. And here's what, we, here's what happened. The children who got the blocks, 59% of them played with them on a typical day, as opposed to 13% who didn't get the blocks initially. They played for about 20 minutes a day, about one and a half episodes a day, and about 65% of the time was with their parent. And then six months later, we assessed their language. And see on the right here that the kids who got the blocks late scored in the 42nd percentile, which is below average, but unfortunately not uncommon in low-income populations uh, in Seattle and for that matter around the world. And the kids who got the blocks 
they actually scored a 56th percentile, significantly better and slightly above average. So promoting that kind of interactive play actually promoted language development in these young children. So I want to conclude by impressing on you that early childhood is very important for children and, and for mice,、uh, and it's critical to their development. And we need more real-time play today and less fast-paced media, particularly for young children. It's vitally important that we have that because if we change the beginning of the story, we change the whole story. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>